right, welcome back. Welcome back to The Pop, a.k.a. the Preston Outdoors podcast. This is episode 12 of the podcast. I talked about it uh, in the last one that on average, seven episodes is what the average podcast lasts, and we've made it past that even though we took a couple couple months break, but we're back. Um, today's special guest and, and uh, a topic that I kind of wanted to talk about, and I approached this guy about this, um, something that we've done. Uh, I talked about in private or you know, person to person kind of thing quite a bit. And that is, um, DIY dog training. And, uh, I'll get into a little bit more of my history on that, but we're going to bring a good buddy, AJ Potter on, uh, if you've seen any of the videos and stuff like that, or social media posts that we do here at Preston Outdoors, you've seen AJ for quite a while. If you're an OG follower on the YouTube channel or on the Instagram page, um, you'll know we've been hunting together for quite a, quite a while. So, um, yeah, if you guys enjoyed the last episode, make sure you go ahead and we're going to do the shout out. Um, go ahead and like the, shut this phone off here, like the uh, podcast platform, whatever platform you're on, go ahead and like and subscribe or leave us a review. I have read a couple of views on the uh, iTunes or the Apple podcast kind of thing. It was pretty cool to see some people actually going and reviewing and leaving some comments on there. I think it's really Uh, Really, really cool. Again, if you want to do any topics, I just did another, a couple days ago, just did another, actually two of them, back-to-back days, did some question on my Instagram story on what some subjects that you guys would like to hear about. We've got wild game processing. We've got some more bass fishing episodes. We've got some offshore bass fishing that people want to hear about um, and a couple other hunting topics. So I've got them all written down here in my notebook right here so we'll be able to cover a lot of those over the next time period but for me what we've got coming up here and we're going to talk more with this on on aj with aj excuse me is hunting season last week's or last time's episode was with zach michelson we talked about um early season deer hunting i don't know if you guys went and followed zach or not he shot a nice buck shortly after we uh aired the podcast so that was pretty cool pretty cool to see. Um, this, this podcast is going to be a little bit different. We're not going to go into, um, just for the season time season wise and where it's going to apply to you. We're not going to go into like, if you just got a puppy, um, for the dog training sessions, I'm going to pick AJ's brain on something he's doing before, just before the season or some stuff he's gone over in the summertime for, for working with drills and stuff for his dog in the springtime. I've got it down on my calendar. We're going to talk about, hopefully get AJ back on here and talk about some things that you just got a puppy. Um, you want to help train it, that kind of thing. Um, I'm not saying that nobody's getting a puppy this time of year for hunting, but most of the, um, hunting dog sales for puppies and stuff like that is definitely in the spring. That way people can work with them over the summer and then they're able to hunt that first full season. So that's something that we're going to talk about. But once again, if you guys haven't already, check out Preston Outdoors on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and also we have a TikTok channel as well. If you want to go ahead and check us out there, we got some exciting announcements coming up here shortly that you'll be able to follow on all the social media pages. And again, that's a way for you to connect to me. If you got any questions, send me a DM on Instagram. I'm on there quite a bit. Otherwise, if you got any questions, Preston Outdoors to the number two at gmail.com send me an email um i would really love to do a question and answer podcast um with a bunch of questions that were sent in from you guys stockpile them up and then you know do a q and a i think it'd be be pretty sweet so um let's see yeah that's about all we got here um here shortly we're going to bring aj in and we're going to talk about some dyi uh dog training tips especially for this summer to just before season and during season stuff like that so thanks for watching and aj will join us shortly all right everybody welcome back to the pop aka the preston outdoors podcast as i mentioned briefly before we're bringing in aj potter aj how's it going good man how are you oh can't can can't complain can't complain if everybody doesn't know this aj and i like i mentioned in the beginning are pretty good friends uh went to college together played football together and snap and talk almost every day so this isn't that big of a uh, I guess reunion kind of thing we get to talk a lot so (laughs) but no I really appreciate you coming on and and talking about this this is you know when I brought up and actually have it on my piece of paper here I wrote topics I wanted to talk about um, as you know going season to season the dog training thing was something I wrote down and definitely want to get you on here and, and talk about it 
Yeah, sounds good. Appreciate you having me. So I know you pretty well. We just talked about this, but tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us, like, it, you know, how you got into hunting, you know, how much you like it, what's your favorite kind, or you don't even have to mention that, whatever. But then yeah. um, maybe a little bit more on how you got into dog training kind of thing. Okay, yeah. Um, well, I'm AJ Potter. I uh, live on Western North Dakota now. I kind of grew up in Minnesota. Um, got into hunting. That was my dad. My dad's, a, I'd say, a hobby duck hunter. Um, so kind of got introduced to it with him. He goes out when he thinks he can shoot birds, and that's about it. He doesn't. He's not really in it for the grind. He's in it for the, the trophies, I think. But uh, got into it when I was, I don't know, 14, 15, um, hunting with him. And that's kind of when all the dog stuff started too. Uh, I worked at a kennel. It was a Hidden Acres Pet Resort and dog training. And uh, what is it? It's probably not Clearwater. It's uh, probably Silver Creek, Minnesota is where their address probably actually is. They do a lot of field trial stuff, uh, all that kind of training. So that was really cool. Got to work with a professional dog trainer. I mean, he makes <laughs> money on it. So I'm sure he's a professional. Uh, dang good, dang good trainer. Um, I was just kind of a hand for him and that's, that's where I kind of got into it. And then we ended up buying our first chocolate lab. Her name's bell kind of worked with her back home. And, uh, then I got the new dog Duke here when we were in college it was that sophomore year mm -hmm. and, uh, just kind of worked with him and trained a little bit, but yeah, I'd say if, as far as favorite hunting goes, it's probably still duck hunting by a little bit, but pheasant hunting is, has kind of taken taken over part of the game for me too it's it's fun to watch the dogs once they get the hold of it so they're hand in hand for me but I'd, I'd give the edge to duck hunting a little bit yeah because that was my next question and I, I guess I didn't even remember you telling me backing up a little bit telling me about that you worked at a dog training place at it I didn't know that it's still pretty cool even if you weren't actually doing the training seeing how it's done and, and kind of firsthand is is you know pretty valuable information yeah, it was super cool, and and I kind of shared an interest with him in the dogs side of things. So he kind of took me under his wing a little bit. Um, by no means a professional dog trainer or anything. I think it'd be a sweet, but yeah, watching him send dogs on, you know, six, seven hundred blind blind retrieves, it was cool to see. Um, obviously, I, my dogs aren't to that level, but <laughs> I, I don't have the time he has. I can't do it sixty hours a week like he can. So. Yeah. Yeah, and you touched on it. The next question uh, I had is basically your favorite species to hunt, obviously ducks, but is there one that you'd pick that, you know, you want to go for the most or you prefer to go for? Oh, man, I love hunting dry field mallards. Yeah. Uh, they, got, they got a place in my heart. Um, I'm excited next year going to Maine to go sea duck hunting. Mm -hmm. That'll be really fun. That's kind of a bucket list one. And then one day this just sits on the desk. One day I'd like to shoot one of these actually colored up. That's it's my favorite duck right here. It's a spoonbill. I don't know. Probably get made fun of for that one, but <laughs> now that's on the hit list. But I'd say dry field mallards. I don't know about you, but I, I think those are probably my favorite birds to shoot there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like that was actually the next question is like kind of talk about what your favorite way, your favorite, you know, species to hunt, obviously mallard and your favorite way to do it is, is dry fields. I mean, yeah my history into duck hunting is a little, I got started a little, a lot later than what you did, or even like when Lex was doing it up there, um, oh, yeah. you know, younger is that we, I didn't really even take an interest to duck hunting until I, I mean, obviously you know this, but when, um, people listening, when AJ and I became friends in college and Lex had duck hunted some before we actually went out with my brother, uh, it was like Dakota McGough and you, me and Lex, we went out and actually yeah. for the first time did a field hunt. Like before the history that Ellie and I have was just puddle jumping. I take my German short hair, we'd shoot a duck, you know, scare him up, shoot one, she'd bring him back, that kind of thing. And getting out, sitting in a field, we had snow come in, everything like that. And I was like, we're not going to shoot anything. Didn't even bring the GoPros. And it was like the first hunt where we were like two birds away from a five man limit. I mean, obviously you remember it pretty well. Yeah, and that was hunt like, was a blast. I was like, this is freaking awesome. And then every yeah. year after college is when we started hunting a lot more. So, um, but yeah, my favorite, I still think it's mallards. You know, if I was to choose for waterfall and yeah, in the field, just, I do like the simplistic hunting of, of water. You know, you don't need many, deep oh, yeah. a couple of mojos, the high is easy, that kind of thing. You don't have to get up as early, but I've never, I've never seen birds do it as dirty as they do in a field. Um, especially during migration in a cornfield hide, nasty weather. I've never seen ducks do it that well. Um, so for me, if I was hunting, 
if I was hunting birds or ducks or whatever, that that's, I'd be the same way as you are. Now I, the only thing I differ from is for species to hunt. I still think it's pheasants for me. Um, if I, I tell people every day, if I had to give up anything like hunting in general, anything, uh, I'd give it up and just hunt pheasants if I had to. I mean, that's what I've been doing yeah. since I was walking fields with my dad, my grandpa, since I was four years old. So I, that's just, that's just for me, but uh, the waterfall thing, getting to know you guys in college and hunting with you, that's, it, it, there's no way I can't even put it into words for the people that are listening on the podcast. I can't even put it into words. It's just the, if you go for the amount of time invested for the actual, what you get out of it, it's probably yeah. not worth it at all. No, you know I mean? no. <laughs> I'm working, I'm, no, working yeah. on, I'm working on our Kansas hunt. We went on in 2019, the series of travel. It was, so people know it was myself, my brother, Elliot, AJ, our buddy Dalton and Lex. We all went down to Kansas for a big hunt. And the amount of time we put in scouting, setting up and versus the amount of birds we shot was like, the outcome was definitely not what we wanted, but it's yeah. the same thing. It's the same thing anywhere else. You get up so early, you stubble blind, you do all this. It's not it's really not worth it in the end if somebody's looking to like fill the freezer or like just stack a bunch of birds all the time. But yeah. there's something cool about watching birds just come in on top of you and they have no idea you're around. Yeah. It's something fun about tricking them. Like you said, I mean, pheasant hunting is way more simple. You get a, some shells, with orange vest and you go walk through a field with a dog and you can shoot your <laughs> limit of pheasants, you know, if you're in the right field. Yeah. But, uh, you know, as far as filling the freezer goes, yeah, I put in way too much money. I, I could fill my freezer with a lot of, a lot of beef uh, <laughs> with the new trailer, the new boat, all the decoys. I mean, I, I'm in it deep. That's why it's my favorite. But for me now, at this point, it's not even about the, you know, the kill anymore. It's, it's those mornings, those trips that we all spend out together in the field that, I mean, you build that camaraderie, you find your group of people you like to hunt with. And I mean, you go out, you spend four hours in the blind, you laugh, you shoot, you know, maybe you shoot 40 birds, maybe you shoot three, it's still a good time. Um, yeah. But tricking birds to come in from a mile, like some of those late season migrators see the mojos and everything and they just drop. That's, uh, that's what gets me still. It, yeah. And yeah, I, unless you've done it. So anybody that's listening, this hasn't waterfall hunted, even if you do the more simple way of going out hunting water, like you've got to try it. Like I'm, I'm really glad we got into it. Like just, just the other day we went out, I watched a, like I, I sent you a Snapchat. I watched a goose feed for yep. all week and the birds did not come in. We shot, ended up shooting doves and pigeons. Basically at, at the end of the day, we put out the dove mojos <laughs> and stuff. And, but Elliot called in a single that must, I don't know how high that sucker was. It was super high in the wind, called it in maple leaf down to like 50 feet swung around the corner i lifted the flag elliot chuckled it in and it just maple leafed in touched it was just about to put on the brakes and touch it on the ground and we called it and dad went up and shot the bird and i and i was like god i'm a freaking idiot Elliot goes why i was like because that's one of the coolest things i've seen in a, in a while and i didn't pick up my big camera all i did was yeah. sit there like this and just <laughs> watch it do its thing and i was like that literally for me what we were talking about that is the epitome of what you enjoy. Oh yeah. That's, you know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. addicting, but besides hunting, besides like waterfall hunting, something like that, what do you like to do? I mean, outside of, you know, obviously this time of year is your grind. I know that for sure. Yeah. But besides hunting, like what's something else that you'd like to enjoy? Oh man. Um, well, I just had a one year anniversary with the wife. Um, so spending time with her and the dogs around the house. Yeah. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> Spending time with the family, um, whether it's the in-laws right down the road or, you know, drive back to Minnesota, hang out with my parents out on the lake back over there. Mm -hmm. uh, big family guy, like spending time with family. Got a few friends out here. Uh, I guess lately I've been getting more back into the gym, so that's kind of become a hobby. Yeah. Uh, other than that, yeah, I mean, hanging out on the boat, fishing, hanging out with the wife and the family. I'm a pretty simple guy. I don't do too much. Uh, just kind of oh. hang out and chill pretty relaxed <laughs> there's nothing there's definitely nothing wrong with that but you know we're gonna we're gonna get into it here now you mentioned something the investment and stuff that you've done um over the years to to get into this and what aj touched on briefly before is that like i said his sophomore year of college had the opportunity to get a puppy and you know what was what was duke like 50 bucks or something like that yeah 50 bucks yeah um professor king's lab got uh pregnant from the neighbor dog who jumped the fence and yeah mm -hmm. he, he wanted to get rid of him so he said 50 bucks so 
AJ goes, and I, I remember kind of vividly coming to chemistry the one morning. He goes, dude, I just bought a dog last night. I was like, what do you mean you bought it? He's like, yeah, I bought a dog. First thing he said, I said, male or female? And he goes, well, I bought a male. I'm like, oh, my gosh, here we go. This is yeah. this, this is not what you want to do. And and like I said, we were all – we were hunting still. This is like our second year. Like our The first hunt was like what, his – would have been your sophomore year or your freshman year. My freshman year. My sophomore year. So that next year, the junior, or that spring of, yeah, it would have been the spring. So we're going into that full season of my junior year, your sophomore year. I don't know how it works out. But anyway, he got, got this dog. And before we were all running out there to get birds in the water, like we were doing the hard stuff, you know, what guys get started running in waders or, you know, filling your waders or your muck boots up to full of water. If we're hunting water to get these birds yeah. Or oh, yeah. running 500 yards, just get a sailed bird. Like we're just what kids were doing. And AJ decided to get a dog. And I remember, I'll probably never forget this. You asked me that one day or a couple of days after that, you're like, I think I'm going to send him to a trainer. And I was like, dude, no, you, you can do this yourself. You think so? I said, I, well, I remember I, yeah. said, I t- told you the same thing. I told everybody half an hour a day. And I bet you, you won't even spend most of the time over a half an hour as a puppy stage and you'll be able to, to work with them. Yeah. Yeah. And I looking back on it, I owe you a, I owe you a big, uh, thanks for that. Cause <laughs> no. it, yeah, the, the time put in is well worth it once you see him come around the corner. But yeah, mm-hmm. I, I wanted to send him cause I, you know, we were busy with football and college mm-hmm. and everything. And I was like, how cool would it be to, you know, pay this guy a little bit of money somewhere, walk, go get a turnkey dog after a year. Um, but you don't build that relationship with the dog that you can get when you're the one spending the time with them and you don't learn their little weird quirks and, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I I did want to send him to a trainer. Looking back on it, I'm glad I didn't. Glad I listened to you. Uh, still don't know if buying a dog sophomore here at college is smart, but here we are. Now. <laughs> but you've you've paid your your investment of fifty dollars over tenfold for what Duke can do now. Oh for sure. yeah, yeah. He's the best fifty bucks I've ever spent. I'll say that till the day I die. I don't know if I'll ever spend a better fifty bucks right there. <laughs> he's been a good dog. So, but that's what I tell everybody if they want to get into it. And like I said in the beginning, we'll touch base on this. Hopefully, do a episode in the spring of like, okay, like AJ got a puppy. You know, you get a puppy. Anybody that's listening or watching, you're gonna get a puppy. What's what's the thing that um, we can talk about? AJ probably has a couple different you know opinions on how to start a dog than I do, which is just fine. So that way you can bounce yeah. around ideas and, and listen to it. But so now that we've got our dog, obviously you've got Duke. I've got Abby um and harper yep. somewhat for pheasant hunting whatever this isn't really about a waterfall this isn't really about um upland hunting we can break it down into both of that but I, what i want to talk about is talk about is like in a week here uh, we're gonna have waterfall opening and you know it goes boom 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 like we've already gone through early goose season here in north dakota it's, it'll wrap up here in a week waterfall full season will start up grouse season just started pheasant season starts after that you've got late season hunting you know later on in the year if you are take us from the summer to yep. right now to yeah take us from the summer to now what are you doing with duke or any any dogs that you've had before what are you doing for drills and stuff like that or if any to keep them kind of sharp and at least kind of you know keep them on their game or some training sessions that you do to uh, you know now that the dog is trained or towards the beginning of the season what's something that you normally do with them to keep them on point yeah, I mean, for me, it was kind of all dependent on their age. Um, mm-hmm. This past summer, I was really lazy with him. Plus, he had a foot injury, so I was kind of healing him on that. So he's got some things we need to work out still uh, mm-hmm. before duck opener here. Um, I think when when he was younger, man, I was doing something every day. Yeah. Uh, whether it was we had that river running right through the backyard, I would set him up and just do simple single double retrieves out of his dog blind. Um, I always try to run him out of his dog blind or make it, you know, a realistic hunting scenario. Maybe now with live gunfire, I just did that the other week, but I, I always try to run him out of what he's going to hunt out of. And generally the way we're, we've hunted uh, ever since I got him and you've had Abby is they're in dog blinds or they're on a dog stand. Yep. So I always work him out of the stand. Um, simple single double retrieves, honestly, mostly I I've done some of the, uh, stuff these past few summers you see like the diamond like the baseball diamond drill where they sit in the middle and you can kind of direct them Mm -hmm. back and forth and everything i've done that that one's super complicated for me Um, luckily (laughs) he's kind of smart so it's kind of worked out but i've kept my dog training with him very simple he's kind of a stubborn 
hard-headed male, as most are. Um, but I, I keep it simple with him. He, he also really doesn't love like playing fetch. I know it's kind of weird. He's half lab, half Weimaraner, but he gets burnt out really quick. Mm-hmm. He likes the real thing. He likes the feathers in his mouth. So I do, I'll cap out at like 10 or 15. Yeah. 15 is probably the most I'll do in a day. Cause then he starts to get sick of it. And then we just start button heads and the whole training session goes downhill. Yep. So I, I think, you know, for me with this dog, it, it's been simple stuff. Our chocolate lab back home, I could do a lot more complicated, you know, three, four dummies out at a time. She'd remember where all of them are, but mm-hmm. yeah, summer, I, I usually just set up the dog line, uh, maybe shoot a 20 gauge over him a couple times, blow on the calls a little bit. That's about it. I'll, I'll set out some decoys every now and then, uh, especially if I'm on water. Yeah. I'll throw out decoys just to, try to get him a little bit more real life scenario training stuff. So do you, do you taper it down as it gets closer to season or will you ramp it up or will you kind of keep it the same from summer to like where we are at the time period now? Yeah. So uh, like I said, this summer is going to be different. I have to kind of ramp it up here this past weekend or this last week and a half mm-hmm. that I got just because of how far we are behind from this With his injury his for his foot. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. He ripped his whole pad off with mm-hmm. one paw. So I, yeah. Um, but yeah, usually I keep it pretty consistent. I'll taper off towards towards the end of summer. Just kind of let him get a week to you know be a dog, have fun at home, and then then the grind starts. And then it's yeah, awesome, so. yeah, that's like I said, based on normal summer, you can do it. And now I wanted to ask you that question because I, like I said, I want everybody listening or watching this. You need to if you're training your dog, if you already got it set up the way you want to, you need to understand how your dog is. Now, Abby, 100%. like yeah, you have to. Abby, we we play fetch in the house. We play fetch before we go to bed. Like it is just it is just her. Now she's a lab and a short hair mix. Same yep. same as AJ's. It's a mix. Um, unreal fetch drive. Sadie, my short hair was the same way Duke was. I could maybe when she got older, three four tosses of the dummy or the bumper, and that was it. Like, but yep. obviously the vest goes on, the collar goes on. It's game time. So yep. I wanted to know what you did. I do the kind of like I don't do drills with her during the summer now we're at the lake and like I said she has such a high fetch drive that we're in the house like just before we came on here I was eating supper watching tv with the wife and I got brought a rope toy five times so she I make her sit she stays lay down all those commands like we do like that so I don't actually go out in the summer because I'm fishing most of the time (laughs) yeah yeah you're a little busy (laughs) (laughs) and we're being honest I'm fishing but I don't do the drills per se take the blind out that kind of thing um, but I know when it's game time, like I, I, before early goose, before we went out this year, I took the blind out. Cause I was kind of worried at some point. I'm like, okay, it's go time. Is she going to know like just a little bit? I set the blind out. I put it out there. She jumps into it. Five retrieves. I did like five open retrieves in the grass, five blind retrieves in the trees. We're good to go. But it's, you need to know how your dog is. And just because you do it, you have a general breakdown of how your dog is going to be. If you get a new dog, it's going to change. So be open to, to maneuver and adjust with each, each dog. Yeah, hundred percent. Every dog's different. I mean, like, like Abby, you can play fetch with her literally 24 seven. I've sat at your house before and you get to the point where you're like, Holy cow dog. <laughs> I, <laughs> dang it, dude. Like go away. I'm sick of throwing this. Exactly. For you. Exactly. Um, but he he used to be like that now that he well, i'd say once he hit three mm-hmm. he don't he don't like he likes the real game i mean he'll go get birds all day you punish yep. him he'll go get, oh yeah he'll go get ducks all day long because uh, he gets the feathers in his mouth and it's game time and, mm-hmm. but yeah training i i'd say right now i i would never go over 15 with him and yeah. that's stretching it right there it'd be 15 and then another point that you you mentioned you mentioned the budding the heads kind of thing i is just one thing i tell everybody is that your training sessions are work to us working on their things but it's a game to them and oh, yeah. so as soon as the dog like today harper freaking brought me a dead pigeon don't know where it came from <laughs> so i was like this is an opportunity i made her point at the pigeon i made her go get it and bring it back four retrieves yep. with a dead pigeon and then she wouldn't bring it to my hand i said we're done it's the same thing in any training session. That was just an instance that happened to me today. But any training session, you know, Duke's max is about 10. And as soon yep. as he stops bringing it back, he starts walking back. You can tell by your dog's demeanor that it's not as much fun anymore. That's when your training session stops. You always start and end on a high point is, is my biggest yep. key there. So knowing that as well. So 
maybe, I mean, the way my grandpa explained to me when I first got started doing this is that they're just like us. They have bad days. There's going to be days. I mean, I was watching some of the videos that we've done before where Abby will, you know, won't listen as well or training sessions yeah. where they won't listen as well. So you've got to gauge that. Even if your dog is seasoned, Duke is how old now? Uh, six and a half. I'm no, six seven. and a half. Yeah. Abby's five. You know, they are going to have, even though they've had hundreds of birds, hundreds of retrieves, all this repetition, they're still going to have bad days. So you as the owner, as the trainer, the person in command, need to understand and recognize when that is happening so you don't push them over the edge. Because as soon as it's not fun for them, then, then it's work and you don't want that correlation. You want them to keep, you know, every time you, you whip it out, it's going to whip the dummy out and get ready in the blind they want to go. Yeah, hundred percent. I always try to start them off too with something fun. Like I won't throw them in the blind right away. I'll drag the dummy around, even though he's six in the grass and throw it and I'll let him play with it a little bit. and We'll have a good time. I won't get to work. He'll be in the blind. We'll do our work or whatever. And then I ended on something fun too. Mm -hmm. I'll try to, you know, amp him back up for the dummy for one last throw. That's just a lollygate. He doesn't have to stay or nothing. He gets to run out. And I'll let him usually carry it back to the house or to the pickup or whatever. You know, it's his. He gets to end the training session with his dummy and he has a fun time. And then, yeah, I think getting on a positive note and starting on a high note is, is good because you're going to have your walls in training. Just oh, happens. yeah. It's, it's like anything else. So yeah. when you're going, now we're transitioning. Okay, we got started. We've got a couple hunts in, you know, whatever. Are you working with him in between, like during the week or anything like that? Or are you just letting them, letting them recoup? No. Yeah, not at all. Um, I used to. Now he's he's getting kind of old, and I don't know if it's the Weimaraner or what, but he's starting to get more stiff in between mm -hmm. hunts. Um, so he's getting a little old, getting a little, you know, beat up. He's got some joint problems and everything. So when we're not hunting, because when I go hunting now, because I get five days off every two weeks or whatever, my stretch is five days off. Mm -hmm. So when I'm hunting, I'm hunting, and it's five days in a row. It's a hard five days. And then when we're done, he, he gets his time to rest in between. Yeah. So he'll get, you know, eight or eight or whatever days off. We'll play out in the backyard. We got a frisbee out in the backyard. I'll mess around and play with him. But yeah, there's no during season there's no training for me because he doesn't like it. He's too tired and I'm too tired and I gotta go back to work. And yeah. yeah. And I guess I would both of our dogs, I mean, people probably listen to this that don't know as much as a hunting dog is that they're a working breed. So like ten years is about like not saying the max, like my dog Sadie lived till she was 13. Okay. We hunted her yeah. till she was 13, but they got a lot. It's not like a dog that's in the house, you know, runs around, whatever. I mean, there, it's a lot of work coming in and out of blind swimming, all that stuff. So their body gets, you know, more beat up. So six years old to somebody is, you know, it's to us, it's not old, old, but he's getting older kind of thing. But so if you're yeah. starting off with a younger dog, you know, maybe, take them out, put them in the blind for five, six retrieves in between your hunts, just to reinforce yeah. what happened there. Or I've done it before, man. I get a teal or something like that, or a, fe or a duck, whatever, pheasant, grouse. I might not even clean the thing. I'll put it in the freezer, pull that dead, you know, full bird out and mm -hmm. drag it around for them in the middle of the week before you go. When I was, when I was younger, I'd take a pheasant the morning. I had a frozen one in the freezer. I morning when Sadie was one or two years old, I'd let her smell it or whatever. And I'd throw it in the freezer and then we go hunting. I don't know if that helped her at all or it helped me, but you know, with, with what Abby and Duke do um, during the week. And again, I just want to know what your opinion was. You can, if they're younger, I would definitely try a little something, something with them. Oh, yeah during in between hunts but i was just curious of what you did with duke because like you said aj has the opportunity in this for the people that don't know this this is his go time like i said he doesn't fish very much doesn't really care to do that hangs with family all his money's invested in his decoy trailers duck boat all that stuff decoys and so when he gets his days off like he's gone so it yeah. would almost be counterintuitive for you to really push you not not necessarily push him but at least like bug him a whole lot in these in these training seminars especially it's not like most people you get a saturday sunday you get two days of hunting five days off or five days for the dog to rest it's kind of the opposite for him yeah exactly yeah we hit it hard for you know five in a row usually have a travel day in there but mm -hmm. i mean he'll get and then once pheasant season starts up, I mean, you're hunting ducks in the morning, you're hunting pheasants in the afternoon. Yes. So he's go, go, go all day long. So it's literally just feeding him, letting him rest. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I used to definitely do a lot of stuff. And especially if we had a bad hunt, I'd bring him home into the backyard and valley. And uh, 
work with them out on the river because mm-hmm. it was like well you had a bad day let's go you know tune up on some of that stuff and he had a higher drive back then and he was a young dumb puppy so i could get away with it but yeah yep. now if i did it nah, me and him would we wouldn't get along that's for <laughs> sure he wouldn't he wouldn't even do it i don't even know if he'd he, he'd do it for a little bit but i'd maybe be able to get four retrieves out of yeah. him after a long five day hunting so mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's like you said though. If you, if you have a younger puppy, I definitely do it. You got to stay on them a little more because they yeah. just they haven't yeah. been around the block so much. So. Mm-hmm. And I think it'll be different. Like when I'm working with Harper, it is the same as do or the same as like with Duke or any younger puppy. Like I have to stay on her. She is for a female is the most stubborn dog I've had to deal with. You know, yeah, from, she's a little hard headed. Yeah. Oh my gosh, she is. And so for her, <laughs> I want her just as an upland dog. So we work on pointing, we work on releasing, retrieving, that kind of thing. Abby does, you know, is a little bit of both. But I, I mean, I'm the first to admit um, when people ask me that question that I asked you is during the season, do you do much with them? I answer is no. Like I, I'm lazy when it comes to Abby because I've been blessed to to yeah. the way she is. But you also got to recognize we talked to this is going to bounce back and forth every single time you have to recognize how your dog is. And you also I would think, what would you I'm trying to figure out how to do this um, question. But if we've got we're talking general terms here, obviously, both our dogs, you know, from Duke and Abby's wise, they both upland, they both waterfall hunt. Would you see a yep. difference, do you think, in between if you had one that did one or one that did the other in, in um, like, the amount of time that you would put in, per se, or the differences between the two training? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, fortunately, I've always had kind of dual-purpose dogs. Mm-hmm. I think with pheasant hunting, there's not really much you can do, per se, training like a lap. Because I mean, you can introduce them to the sense, like I've done that, you know, you introduce them to sense. Um, but the biggest thing for me when I, when I had him when he was young is I just brought him out with dogs who knew what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And I'd let him run. I let him run free and, you know, go see what the heck is going on. Um, for both, they have to be obedient. I mean, you got to do a ton of obedience for both styles of hunting. But I, I don't know, man. <laughs> instinct wise more so you need to rely on for pheasants to where duck yeah. wise you can work on you know sit watch bird drops you go get it you come back and bring it to me i mean i i've never really trained pheasant hunting dogs i i've just gotten lucky mm-hmm. you know bring them out in the field and hope they step on one yeah and then you shoot it and they get their reward and then yep. they know yeah yeah and that's that's true like i said the first dog abby was the first dog that i've ever trained waterfall hunting so i was on the complete opposite thing um when i trained sadie i was 11 you know we did upland that's all we did like i said before we didn't duck hunt at all so the mistake i made with abby is when i started her off i i said she's going to be a waterfall dog so everything was the drills that we talked about but then what she did was is she hunted with her eyes I and remember that, yeah. Hunted with her eyes so bad to where we'd be walking and she'd stop and listen for something running in the cattails. Like just that this is just after Sadie passed away or or Sadie stopped hunting after she hurt her shoulder. We went out two or three more times. Abby's running around, she stops and listens, and then she started jumping like a deer through the cattails looking for pheasants. <laughs> yeah, and hoping to step on one. Yes, and all and but if she saw one, like you'd shoot one and she'd find it, she'd use her nose because she thought something was in the area. So if you're my, like I said, if, if you want a more of a dual purpose dog, kind of like what they are now, our dogs is my tip would for you would be any of your training sessions is mix in the sight retrieves and mix in the blind retrieves. So I take my dummies and I throw them in the tall grass. I throw them in the trees or if it's behind a stick or something like that, and they're in their kennel or on their blind, I make them stay in there. I'll walk in front of them. I'll put my hand in front of their eyes, just mess up their line of vision and send them out. And you can tell that then they're forced to use their nose. But if, if you are, I would say this after your puppy figures out and stuff like that of your mid summer training, I do not go back to, for an upland dog, I do not go back to line of sight retrieves. Everything's in the grass, everything's in the trees, wherever, where they can't see it. And they're forced to use their nose as for a waterfall dog. As you know, like AJ mentioned, they're sitting on a blind. They're sitting, you know, sitting on a stand, sitting in the blind. Half the time, they're watching the birds. I mean, I, I know many times where you look at Duke, and Duke's got a bird spotted before we do. 
Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So those dogs are marking birds with their eyes. I would say this: if you want to do upland, once your dog gets done, like we episode we'll talk about later, get them the retrieves. I wouldn't throw it in where they could line a sight. If you're doing a, a waterfall dog, I would mix it between both. I wouldn't go all line of sight because you drop you drop birds in the grass, you drop them in the cattails or thicker, you know, field hunting stuff like that. So mix that what that's what I would say for a tip for somebody is mix it up for line of sight and and smell just so your dog gets trained that because that's a mistake I like I said with Abby, she did not want to use her nose. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, she did. She, yeah. Now, now she sounds like a Hoover vacuum. You can't hear anything on camera when she's <laughs> using her nose. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that definitely those. I, I don't know if they're blind retrieves or whatever you want to call them, but mm-hmm. hiding something in tall grass or throwing them in tall grass. Uh, I've walked out and put him in a kennel, or you know, where he can't see it all, walked out and hid three or four. Mm-hmm. With some of that cheap scent from like Runnings oh, yeah. or Walmart, that stuff's great. I mean, if you don't want to, you know, keep live birds or. Uh, wings or anything in your freezer you go buy some of that scent and put it on those dummies i mean it stinks forever yep uh, but yeah then you just walk them in and you know i think both of us are the same when there's a down bird or whatever it's dead bird mm-hmm. so uh, then you know it's kind of funny to watch them both on video now because they hear dead bird and both their heads are like this and they pray down to the ground i mean they're running and their noses are on the ground so it's fun mm-hmm. to watch them but yeah definitely definitely making them use their nose you can't take away that instinct and i think that's where Some people mess up by only training, kind of like you said, only training for, you know, waterfall, but you still Mm -hmm. want to be able to take them out for pheasants. Like if you only do things where they can see what the heck is going on, you're going to wreck the fact that, you know, they might have a fabulous nose, but they never had to use it. Yeah. So then when it comes time to use it, if they don't have that instinct that kicks in, they're just going to be running around like a chicken with their head cut off, hoping to step on something. Yep. And I've noticed over the last couple of years compared to some of the dogs I've hunted with, or done before abby doesn't have the best nose like that's that's just net genetics and that's just the way you know way it is like if i'm comparing her to, to sadie's nose there's no comparison but yeah. she does she does i mean do a lot of things that sadie never did do but i'm just saying that i've realized over the last couple of years so you have to adjust to that you know if you're yeah, right. if you're buying a more expensive dog whatever sometimes they work sometimes they don't i'm just saying you have to realize how good your dog is we used to have an english setter her name was Birdie. If she locked up on point, there was a bird there. Like, yeah. there's no false points. Yeah. I mean, she would walk past birds because they've ran. But, like, if there's a bird holding and that dog locked up on point, there was a bird there. Where yeah. other dogs would have a better nose, lock up, and then, you you know, we'd hunt to where the bird had ran to. So you have to, you know, maybe suck up some of your pride and realize, hey, your dog isn't the best at this, that, and the other thing. But what I what we always do is adjust your style to what the yep. dog the dog is good at and stuff like that so yep. but yeah you gotta we're gonna go back and forth every single time but you're gonna have to adjust to where your dog is and your style that's something yeah. i want to talk about after my next question for you but is um the season's over you're done it's freezing cold out whatever you know like even upland or duck hunting stuff like that are you pretty much taking the winter off or are you going to still kind of do some drills and stuff maybe outside or inside your house yeah, no, I'm too lazy. Uh, <laughs> by the time duck hunting's done, uh, and then you get those last few weeks of pheasant season, I'm burnt. So, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, I take the winter off. I let him be a dog. I let him be a house dog. I let him not have any cares in the world. He gets to come home, be fat and sassy, and mm-hmm. I don't I don't worry about his weight, really, in the winter. Uh, don't worry about his fitness. Like, he's he's a fat, lazy couch dog when, when the winter hits. And then I'll revamp it up a little bit in the spring when it gets nicer out. But yeah, I, I'm lazy when I, when season's done and I don't like the cold. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and he doesn't either. You know, you've hunted with him. Uh, yeah. Kind of goes back to knowing your dog. He he is half lab, but he's half Weimaraner. His coat is more Weimaraner than lab, 100%. Mm-hmm. He's got a little bit of lab down the middle of his back that's thick, but, like but his chest thin. has no hair on it. So he gets cold and he gets cold fast. And when yep. he gets cold, if he's not pheasant hunting and actively doing something, he gets sick of it and he'll start holding up a paw and he's done. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if it, I don't, I don't do anything in the winter. I don't know if you do, but the winter time for me is relaxing time. And we just kind of hang out and be buddies at home. And I'm no longer the, the boss per se. I'm just your dad. Yeah. I'm just the guy on the couch feeding them cheese. It's or whatever. You know? Yeah. No, for me, like I said, I don't do much drills anymore anyway. Um, yeah. but, 
her fetch drive is so high, like every day, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I play fetch with her every single day. I, you know, I, I do this drill kind of what I made up when she was a puppy is that I take her rope toy away. I put it between my arms and I just say my toy. And she, it's one, a way that I've in my head, it works and I've seen it work for her anyway to where she starts digging at my arms and getting in there kind of growling playing. She's never bites me or anything, but then gets yeah. super aggressive. Like what I want her to do kind of, and goes in there and pulls that toy out because I've seen too many times where you down a pheasant. And for people that don't know, you know, if you're not, if you're not hunting, like when we went to Kansas and they're hunting pen raised birds, that kind of thing, the birds up here, that North Dakota, lot. South Dakota are, are tough as hell basically is what yeah. it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You knock them down. Uh, just last year, there was one buried in the cattails. My dad, he marked it. I walked over there and I said, dead bird. And we had four dogs out at the time and we could not find it at all. And all of a sudden I hear the Hoover vacuum, her just sucking oh, yeah. in and I saw dirt flying and I go over there and it's just her tail sticking out and I pull the cattails back and she's actively digging and kind of growling the same noise I do when I do that drill pulls out a pheasant that dug himself in a hole, you know? So between that playing with her, with that toy or playing fetch, that's kind of, that's all I really do um in the in the winter time but it's just mainly because she keeps bringing me the stupid toy every single time but like i don't actively go out and do drills with her or anything yeah i'd say when, when duke was a puppy i did more obedience stuff during the winter you know i'd mm -hmm. work with him on heel sit lay down walk across the house heel sit lay down yeah uh, and do obedience stuff but yeah as far as going outside no I, yeah I don't do it. and you I'll play with him in the house we'll play tug of war but that's about it Mm -hmm. <laughs> and exactly what you said is that if you like i said if you got a younger dog don't take the winter off i would say um yeah. all the stuff i may do a couple of those retrieves in the house where she's free to go do whatever she wants but yeah. most of the time i'm making her sit stay she's doing on her release command even with harper i make her point in the house i say whoa <laughs> and she has to stand there and hold her point until i release her so you can take um any of those little time periods you have five ten minutes you can do that throughout the winter I was just curious oh, from a, you know an older dog standpoint if that's something you know more seasoned dog if there's something you did in the winter time but um, you know just kind of let him hang out and be a be a dog for a while but there was a point you mentioned um, about his diet is there something you do is do you change his diet up from you know say summer to season to off season kind of thing that you mentioned yeah I do um, so winter he he gets cut back on food but he's not really exercising. So uh, during the winter and spring, I'll feed him, I don't know, three cups a day, probably, give or take. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't, I don't like have an exact measurement. We have a cup in there, but I fill it till it looks right and I go. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in season, uh, summer, I'll start to bulk him up a little bit, maybe up to, you know, almost four cups a day. Uh, but, and naturally he's an 85 pound dog. Yeah, he's big. So he's a big dog. Um, so, you know, it's going to differ from every dog, but then in season, I'm feeding him five cups a day, especially during pheasant season, maybe even more. He, he's eating a lot during those duck and pheasant combo days. Yeah. Um, he's eating a lot of food and he's getting, you know, his joint medication and stuff. Um, uh, so I, I definitely increase, increase the food during season just to help him out a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. he needs to recover from those hunts and everything. So putting some protein in them and, and a little bit of fat has uh, yeah. been it, but yeah, no, I just more and more food in season and less food off season. Yeah. And I don't know if, I mean, Duke, he, he probably eats better than Abby does. Like if you get up in the morning, she won't eat. Like there's no, there's no eating before we go hunting. So I don't know. Duke eats pretty much. Doesn't he give him a scoop of food before you take off or yeah, you, you run so, him dry? Uh, but before Duck, oh, like duck hunting or whatever, you know, I'll wake up an extra 10, 15 minutes early and I'll give him like a cup. Like, mm -hmm. I'll actually measure that out, like nothing more than a cup of food. Um, and then afterwards, he'll get two cups and then maybe at night we'll get another two. Yeah. But yeah, I try, I try to give him something in the belly because um, he gets so worked up. You've seen him. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, he's ready he, to go. He, yeah, he gets so worked up. It's like, I need, I I remember like going back to football games and everything. Like I couldn't perform even at practice in two days if I didn't eat, you know, peanut butter jelly sandwich on the way down the line. Mm -hmm. There was never anything major, but just something. So I try to give him a little something on the belly. But some mornings he eats it. Some mornings he kind of sticks his nose up to it. But yeah, and that's where like 
if if I do it, I'll get up early, I'll start coffee, whatever. And I try and I try and get everything packed the night before as much as I can, just for the yep. simple fact, like if I bring out my hunting pants, if I bring out oh, yeah. the oh, bag, yeah. the bag that has the collar yeah. and the vest and stuff in it or whatever, she's she know Abby knows what's going on. There's no like calming her down or like whatever. Yeah. So like if I can, I try and get up a little early and remain calm, get her woken up, you know, put her outside, come back from the bathroom, and then she might eat something. Right or wrong, I mean, I don't know, but Sadie was the same way as that they they had hunted on an empty stomach. But the thing I do is I come back during the hunting season. I have, I don't know what brand it is. It doesn't really matter, but I have canned dog food that's got extra protein and whatever. And then to make sure I know they eat, um, you can either put I put a couple spoons of that, mix it up, and then I mean it's down the hatch. And uh, yeah. it it look at your ingredients on it, you know, and stuff like that, your nutrients. But it helps you know, bring the proteins back, give them more energy, that kind of thing. Or another trick that you can do, which it fools the dog every single time you do it for anybody that's done with puppies um, or for mothers or something, take your dog food, soak it in hot water and it'll just make the food soft and they just throw it down. It's the same thing, same whatever, but they throw it down with soft food. So weird. Yeah. We'd done, we'd had to do that before with some of our older dogs, but yeah, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is, whether you feed them or not. Uh, I do. Yeah. Our and taco I, back home, she won't eat once she yep. sees camo. She won't mm-hmm. eat. So. And that's where, like, I try. If I can remember, get everything packed away. She's all freaking yeah. out, whatever, the night before. It's like, just calm down. We've got six hours of sleep here. Most of the time, three hours of sleep. we got to get to bed here kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so before she before she eats kind of thing so that was one of the questions i had for you now for us i mean we've had dogs before where they have to be portioned with their food it's just again the dog situation with with her i just we just leave food out they eat as much as they want when they want kind of thing so it depends on how you do your feed schedule as well for your dog and like i said i am no veterinary expert blah 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 (laughs) so i just said this is what i've done and i haven't had a dog collapse or anything we've done good you know and their performance their performance is is there in the end yeah definitely yeah i I, yeah like you said not a vet don't know the right answer but whatever works for you i've always fed him twice a day i he's not a dog where you can leave a bowl of food in front of him Mm -hmm. because if you put if you put a bag of dog food and you open it up on the kitchen floor he'd eat till he got to the bottom of that bag and yeah. he's done it before, and then his stomach almost flipped that one night, mm-hmm. like Christmas Eve three years ago. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, going back to knowing your dog, you got to know whether you can leave that food out or, you know, start them young where they have the whole bowl and they eat until they're full, and then they can teach themselves to walk away from it. But he can't. He'll, mm-hmm. he'll eat himself literally till death. He's- <laughs> And, but yeah, it's just how it is. Like we did, we've had so many dogs over the years. Only one max was the one that he'd be the same as Duke Harper started off that way because she had 10 other brothers and sisters and she was just a little freaking savage in the bowl. So you give her a scoop and just train her like, okay, you're going to be fine. Nobody's fighting over your food. And then they got those special bowls and stuff you can do with it. So it's to each their own. Some people don't want to have to worry about filling the food dish. And somebody like me, I don't want to have to, oh my gosh, I forgot to feed the dog today. You know what I mean? I just walked by in the breezeway and the bowls need to be filled. There's that kind of thing. Yeah. It's, it's up to you. And like we said, knowing your dog that we've said a million times, we'll say it again. But another question I had for you, what, how do I want to frame this? If you were to give us three tips, I want to go upland and waterfall hunting, three tips or training advice for somebody that, you know, maybe has a dog that they want to try during this year or something that they want to try. Pretty simple stuff that you would say for a waterfall dog and an upland dog. What are three tips that you would just give somebody for advice to, for training their own dog? Oh man. So three for each you're talking. Yeah. Yep. So six total. Cause uh, I, I like I trade them a little bit different just because yeah. I've trained a little bit, but I mean, yes, obviously you're going to have to blend some answers with some answers. And so yeah. most people aren't going to have two dogs, one for each, but right. if somebody has an upland dog and somebody has a waterfall dog separate, you know, somebody yeah. else, whatever, they can take those tips where if somebody's like us and have someone to do both, they can take a little bit of each. So, Oh man, um, I'm going to throw this one in just for any gun dog. So this one's not going to count, but exposing them to gunfire in a smart way. 
Very true. Um, whether your dog is a food driven dog and you got to disguise it with food or your dog is a fetch driven dog and you can disguise, you know, that loud noise um, with playing fetch with them. I, I'd say ex- exposing them to gunfire is, is huge for mm-hmm. both. Cause I mean, you can have a dang good dog with a dang good nose and once it's gun shy, it's gun shy. There's no bringing them back. Really. Um, if so you do, smart, it's a long road, like expect a season and a half of being broke. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, yeah, take your time, do your research on that. Uh, learn what your dog is driven in and use that to disguise the gunfire. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I guess we'll start with upwind. Um, obedience, that's going to be for both of them, but obedience is huge. I've hunted with plenty of dogs back home where, you know, you're out pheasant hunting and they get on a trail and they're 200 yards in the field and they're kicking up 30, 40 roosters. Uh, that's exaggerating on 30, 40 roosters, but they're kicking up birds, you know, 200 yards. <laughs> it 200 looks yards like it that far field. away. Yeah. So uh, obedience is huge for upland hunting, I think. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's a big one for me, even if it's just your recall. Mm-hmm. You know, just keeping them close and having a good recall on your dog for pheasant hunting. Second one would be trust your dog. Put in the work, but trust your dog's nose. Like if, I mean, we've both done it. We both kicked ourselves in the pants. I mean, we've done it together on hunts before where your dog takes off and you're like, no, come here, you idiot. And then you don't follow them. And the next thing you know, there goes a rooster at Always a yards. rooster. Always. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> if you're up on hunting, man, trust your dog. Trust yep. their instincts, especially if they got a decent nose, follow them. Like when I'm out hunting alone, I don't grid pattern anything. Mm-hmm. I tell them to find the bird and I walk by. He wants to go north. I'm going north. He wants to cut back southwest. Yeah, I'm going southwest. Like there's yep. nothing. Yeah, it's funny it. how we treat that differently. When you got a line, okay, this is the plan. This is the plan. And I yeah. mean, I how many times we went down to Ashley? Lex would follow Sadie. I'm like, no, Sadie, we need to go over here. And Lex is yeah. like, I'm like, just follow her. And Lex would shoot a rooster, you know, over yeah. top of her or whatever. Oh yeah, uh, it, yeah. It's yeah. I I love that one. That's one I didn't even think about. I love that answer because yeah, it doesn't matter like. I think Sadie will be the best hunting dog I ever have in my life. And there's more than 10 times I can count where I didn't trust her. Yep. And you kick yourself for it every time. Oh, oh, all the time. Uh, third one. And, and this is just what's worked for me with upland hunting. Um, like I said, I've, I've never trained much in, in upland hunting, mm-hmm. exposing them to it with other dogs. Very. Uh, that's very true. I mean, that's a big if, one though. Yeah. If the dogs are good though, I don't take them out with a dog who's going to do that 200 yards out thing and kicking up birds and, mm-hmm. you know, cause then your dog is going to develop those bad habits. But if you got a buddy or a family member or, you know, someone you hunt with a trainer who's willing to bring you with them or whatever, and he's got good dogs or she's got good dogs and you can let your dog just run with them. Um, that worked huge for him. That mm-hmm. one time down in Ashley hunt was safe. Because then at the end of it, we all came around that corner, and they both had their noses to the ground. They both dove in on the same head. Mm-hmm. Like, that's when the light bulb clicked, and he dove in with Sadie. And, you know, that's where his light bulb clicked. So I, I think if you can trust somebody that has a good dog, mm-hmm. uh, let your dog run with them. I, I, I think for me, that, that'd be the third and final one. But Those are I good. say obedience. Yeah. Obedience and trusting them are so huge. Yeah. Yeah, duck hunting, obedience again. <laughs> you don't want to be the guy, and I, I just did it on early goose because I haven't worked with Duke all summer, and you know he was all amped up to go get that first goose we shot. Mm-hmm. Um, don't be the guy with the breaking dog on the decoys. Right. There's some good dogs who do <clears> that, but I don't like hunting over dogs that do that. So when he did it, um, it was extremely frustrating for me because he's always been – Pretty good at not breaking. Um, he is a hard-headed, stubborn male, but I, I'd say obedience is obedience is huge because you know you don't want them to break out. If you land four geese and you got thirty coming in behind them that are all cupped up, and you're hunting with six dudes, it makes more sense to let the four land, shoot at the thirty in the air, and shoot some off the ground. Mm-hmm. But if your dog busts out of his kennel and you don't have a recall, or you know your, your dog's doing that, you might have just busted your whole hunt. That might be the only flock you see all day. Yeah. Uh, so obedience for that one. Um, oh man. Repetition. I, I was just that. thinking that I was thinking that I, I literally yeah. in my head before you said it, I said repetition. Yeah. Repetition is huge. It, it's, it's just like, you know, if you ever played a sport or a musical instrument or anything, they're not going to get it until they've done it a million times. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
and you can just watch throughout the progression of a dog's life how much better they get at duck hunting or how much oh, yeah. they get at, you know whatever so you it's should, a repetition you and especially should see like the, you said go ahead go I'll, ahead. I'll let you finish oh yeah like like you said earlier when they're young i mean stay on them like work them work them work them repeat 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 mm-hmm. and and stay on them so they you know they kind of start to develop what the yeah. they're supposed to be doing because I I'm I'm editing this video like I talked about before. It's 2019. There is like, and I was watching. I'm like, what the heck is going on? So Abby is two and a half when we went down there. She is breaking out of the kennel so much, and I'm like, dude, like I don't remember this because I just remember now. I'm like, my goodness, what? Uh, I was editing. She was up here. I'm like, what the heck? I was talking to her. What the heck were you thinking? You know, was that two years ago now? I'm like, what the heck? Like they have, she's come across so much better in the last two years. And I thought she was good back then, but we went yeah, down right. to Kansas and it was like, every time I'm having to shock her to get her back in there. So, and and that's on me doing, neglecting it and not doing stuff with her. Like we talked about before, or now, yes, I can get away with it. She's older. She knows the drill, but even at yeah. two years and having two and a half, basically full seasons of hunting breaking out and me not being repetitive with it. And so and yep. to me, like you mentioned, waterfall hunting is more repetitive in the kennel, staying like it, it takes a more like, I would say almost a calmer dog in a way or more control over your dog, no matter what. Yeah. If you have a calmer dog, it's easier, oh, but, yeah. but birds are coming in, they're making noise, you're blowing calls, you know, you're, t- you're communicating all the way down the line with everybody, you scream, kill it, whatever. Doors are popping open, guns are going off, things are falling, and your dog is supposed to sit there. You know I know. What I mean? So yeah. that repetition is definitely like now that you think about it, and I just walk through the progression. I'm like, dude, I don't know if I'd stay in the freaking kennel. Well, right, exactly, because I mean, they're getting more amped up, you know, because they're watching them just like we are. You're getting ready to pull the trigger. How many times do you miss your first shot on a deep All the time. bird like this? Because you're so excited, yep. and they're like, oh crap, freaking aim your gun, stupid. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, you you hop out and. I think most of them, they just want to see what's going on. Yep. So they want to run out. And I think another thing that we've made a mistake with, but you can't really, can't really help it. Uh, Cause we all have dogs. We all want to hunt our own dogs. But when you get three or four dogs in a field, you know, two is manageable. Mm-hmm. When you get to that three point or four, if they're all not really, really good dogs, they start competing with each other too. And if one breaks, you're bound to have another one break. Yep. Cause they're like, screw that. That's my bird. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think being, you know, repetitive with your training and then also correcting your dog it, it, at times you can't get lazy. And I did it just on early goose. Duke broke and I didn't correct him. I didn't make him come back to his kennel, re-kennel before sending him on the bird. I just let him go get it. Mm-hmm. So that was on me. Again, and you have to be able to stay up on your dog. And, you know, sometimes you got to be willing to put the gun down. Yeah. If your dog's having a bad day and you got four or five other guys with guns, Put the gun down, wait till someone limits out, let them run your dog, mm-hmm. you know, if you trust them to do that. Obviously. We, and we've, we've both done that either. Yep. Or now for me, I run the camera a lot, so I don't shoot as much until somebody limits out and then I'll give them the camera kind of thing. So I'm able to run her a little bit more just by voice commands instead of shooting. But you've done it before too. And multiple hunts, you just put your gun down and said, hey, I need to work with him for five, 10. Or you're like the next yep. flock for sure, the next two flocks, I need to you know, work with him. Um, to make sure, because for me, the breaking thing, um, when you and I talked before you were training Duke or, you know, you, I've watched the hunting shows and all this stuff and, and it's a personal preference. If you want to stick your dog in your blind with you and the dog pops out with the door, like, I don't care what you, you do. That's on whatever you guys want to do. I'm not here to tell you this, that, and the other thing, because we'll talk about this in the next episode that we talk about dog training. If a professional dog trainer like my neighbor was to come over and watch me train, he'd be like, this is all wrong. But this is the way I want to hunt. And when I want to hunt, my dog will be in a blind, my dog will be in a stand, and they will not break. That is our rule of thumb, especially on water when you're dealing with crippled birds and swimming and you want to make sure they're dead with the wind blow, all those whatever um, things we ran across. You've got to make sure you can trust your dog because there might be times where you Joe Schmo joins you or a buddy of a buddy and they may not have hunted with dogs or geese, you know, on the ground and and wounded birds, that kind of thing. A lot of dogs get killed because there's crippled birds in the water, crippled birds on land, 
somebody's not paying attention, especially if it's darker out, we both have black dogs, they go running out, you know, that's where your accidents happen. So for me, it was a safety thing. These dogs are not just, you know, machines that we talked about before. They are my pet. They are like my child basically. And so when I leave in the morning, I expect to bring them back. And that was my thing about for waterfall training, especially is they will, they would need to be comfortable, which is back to your repetitiveness in a kennel, in a, in a blind, and they will not release until I give the command kind of thing. And that's my biggest get off my soapbox kind of thing for, for waterfall hunting. But I just feel, and I don't think my dog's better than anybody else's that they do do that. It's just, I want to bring my dog home alive. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I'm the same way. Uh, and even, you know, our chocolate lab back home, she doesn't break until you say bell. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And like you said, I don't know how many times I've set my gun down on a hunt with you guys. Cause he'll break once or that, you know, that first flock on duck opener is tough. tough. They want to go, they want to go. You want to go. So you pop out of your blind. Next thing you know, your dog's already got a duck in his mouth. You're like, what the heck? I didn't mm-hmm. say Duke. Like, did yep. I say Duke or did I say kill him? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that one, that one's tough, but yeah, that kind of, you know, repetitiveness and, and obedience are just so huge with that. Uh, and if most, they don't listen, you're screwed. I mean, realistically. And it only takes one time, one accident, you know what I mean? And I get told like, well, when I'll put my uh, in-laws and even my wife on blast here a little bit when we got Harper a couple of years ago, um, you know, training her at the lake to stay within the boundary or to do this that, and the other thing she would do thing. And I'd say, no, again, bring her back, you know, do all this stuff that we're being repetitive and consistency. Both of them kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Basically, I know that, Oh man, you're kind of being a douchebag. And then, and uh, in other words, I'm like to make things simple, black and white, the way I like to, you know, deal with it is like, yeah, I kind of am because yeah, I don't, this is what I want done. So this is the way it's going to happen. Now Harper's more hard headed. It may take 15 times before she, it's not that she realizes and your dogs might be anybody's dog out there might be this. It's not that they realize the light bulb goes off that they know what they're supposed to do. Harper knows what she's supposed to do and just chooses not to do it. So they, anywhere, basically it's my head against her head and I want to go until she backs down and realizes that I'm dominant and that's why you do it over and over again. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's that's a great point. You got to be able to withstand the the fight and win the fight. Because once they win once, they're gonna think they can win. Every time. You give a mouse a cookie, ask for a glass of milk. That's my analogy for any yeah. of that stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. stupid 100%. little book. So, mm-hmm. but we've been on yeah. here for a while. Go ahead. I'm gonna cut you I off. was gonna say I don't know if I have a third one. I was trying to think of a third one there, but uh... but I I you mentioned it. I think waterfall training a dog is more technical. Um, yeah. The, the best thing I can say for another uh, portion is upland hunting is get them out, like go yeah. out and do it. I took yeah, Harper it. out with Abby the first year and a half here and we just went out there and Abby did all the flushing. Abby did all the retrieving, but get the feathers in the face, do all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. Last year, I finally took out Harper by herself and I had to suck it up that we might not see a bird today. Like that was my thing. Or if it put pressure on me, I need to make sure I make a good shot because I don't know if she'll find it and I hate losing right. birds. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. but get out and do it. And yep. you're not, I think pheasant hunting is easier to drop a hat. I get home from work. Boom. We're going to go five minutes. I'm out the door. Water hunting, more planning. So I think do your repetitions at home, get them ready for game day where take them out and practice basically your game day can happen a lot quicker for upland hunting. That's kind of right, my, yeah. my experience between both of them. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'd agree with that a hundred percent. Yeah. Put in the time before season. Don't expect your dog just to be a, Oh you know, yeah. Don't expect don't. your dog to be Tony Vandermore's dog where you can just say back and he'll go run 900 yards and go get a teal. Mm-hmm. Don't expect yeah. him to do that. Yeah. Without, without working on it all summer long. Yeah. Cause you watched exactly. YouTube videos and didn't take it out for your dog's experience. Right. Exactly. So, but yeah, I'm trying to think. Is there anything else we didn't talk about that you can think of for training them and stuff? Oh Whatever. man, um, I guess for me, one thing now that I look at it, I know we were kind of joking around about it on early goose and everything. Uh, I, I'm a prepper. I'm a preparer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I've seen dogs get injured in the field and everything. Yeah, I don't like it. Um, so like this year, I bought I bought this thing. I know people listening, but if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see it. Get a little first aid kit, whether you make one at home, you know, in your blind bag, in a Ziploc baggie, 
yep. or you want to go buy one. I bought that one because I, I just wanted everything in one thing and you know, you can strap it to anything you want. So I strap it to the outside of my blind bag and, and it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, be prepared for the worst because you never know when that accident's going to happen or you never know when they're going to catch a, you know, catch an ankle in a, in a hole. Mm -hmm. you know? I don't know. It sucks to think about, but I'd you know, rather be safe than sorry. Have something to mend some sort of injury or, you know, when you're out pheasant hunting, when they get all the crap in their eyelids, some dogs get bothered by that. Yeah. Or, you know, you get cut up by cattails. Just, just be prepared for something, whether, you know, you have a little bit of vet wrap in a bag or whatever, but mm -hmm. have something at least. And that, that brings up a big thing. Like I said, I've been, I probably haven't even talked about this on here, but yeah, I mentioned it briefly, but my grandpa, after he retired, actually went and kind of did the same thing you did at a, a gun kennel. He, you know, mm -hmm. ran dogs for guys that came out for hunts, that kind of thing, and actually was a trainer. My dad had always trained his own dog. So I got information for both of them when we got Sadie and I said, I want to train my first hunting dog when I was 11. And that's yep. what I did. I trained her from basically the first three years. So, I mean, she was with me for, 13 years. So I was like 23, 24 when we had to put her down, worked with her the whole way through the biggest thing those guys had mentioned it, my grandpa and my dad, but my mom said it too. When I went out hunting with buddies in high school or went out hunting with, you know, with Sadie in, in college, she said, you are responsible for that dog. She said, you are the person that she is looking for. If something goes wrong, if something goes right or for guidance, they are looking towards you. And yeah. Part of that is, is their safety kit. I always bring tons of water, especially, you know, um, upland hunting. I've got three, four squirt bottles in my thing. I've got <laughs> two gallons. Of, I mean, half my bag is full of water, you know, I'll drink it with her or whatever, but it's all full of water. They might not even need it. There could be snow on the ground. It doesn't matter. I've got water bottles in my thing and bring it up on, or, uh, excuse me, waterfall hunting. You may not be, I brought it early goose stick over. She doesn't drink it at all, but I have it there. So yeah. it, it, that really stuck with me from a very young age when I started taking, you know, after 14, when you can take your, I can drive by myself and Sadie and I would go hunting always. My mom would always, you know, she never went hunting. My mom never did, but she said the same thing. You are responsible for that dog. It is your responsibility. And it really sunk home is that that dog is looking to you. You yeah. are, you know, the saving grace. You are the, if something happens right, the dog's looking for reinforcement from you and yeah. you can do all the training and stuff you want to. And it goes back to me wanting to bring the dog home every single time. Like you said, I love the idea. I don't have one like that. I need to get one, but I've, you know, made one in a Ziploc bag kind of thing, but yeah. water and just prepared for, for the worst. I mean, you know, it, you don't want that to happen. And luckily neither no. one of us have had really had that situation yet where it has happened, yeah. but you are not going to be able to live with yourself very well. If you're, if you weren't prepared, like you said for that. So those are a couple of the tips I had. You are responsible for it. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Bring your dog home. Yeah. yeah. There's no else, no, no better way to put it than that, man. There's no better way. Yeah. Get them home. Yeah. You can do all the training and stuff you want to, and if something, an accident happens, there's. Yeah. I don't even want to think about it. We're done talking about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It sucks to even think about. Yeah. So, anything else we didn't talk about? Like I said, I I really want to do that. Uh, I think we, there's things that I want to talk about here, but it wouldn't make sense for the way we frame this podcast right. episode of, of training and stuff. But um, I, I want to do an episode next spring about, you know, about the time where everybody's getting, getting a puppy, because I think that that is the, just, it's the coolest time, the most frustrating, the excitingest time in the yeah. dog training process. Obviously here now, both of us, we can kind of coast. We put in that year and a half, two years, two and a half, whatever it is to really focus on it. Um, and now to me, this is when you get to really enjoy it. I guess one of the other tips I have too is when you're out there, you got to enjoy it, man. Like That's take, what I was just going to say. Yeah. Go ahead. You finish en it. Enjoy the grind because it is a grind. You're going to have frustrating days, but that day when it all clicks, and, you know, you send your dog and it's picture perfect and you, you hunt with three or four guys and they get 24 picture perfect retrieves. Mm -hmm. You never have to leave your blind. All you're doing is shooting it's so worth it but yeah it's hell I mean, there's some days where you just want to bang <laughs> your head off the wall you're like what in the heck because they'll they'll take steps back and mm -hmm. then they'll take 10 steps forward the next day so yep. yeah enjoy the grind and it's not going to be perfect but enjoy it and use your resources i mean like cornerstone gun dog academy i think is what it's called yep they're great if you're willing to spend a little money they're phenomenal yeah uh, reach out to some of those trainers on forums go read forums just you know enjoy the grind but 
be ready to put in a, a lot of work. If you're going to buy a gun dog, not only is it a lot of money, but it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's about and, it. I think both of us can say ditto on that. Enjoy that grind. It's just like any sport you've played, any degree you've gotten, you know, like you got to enjoy it to that, the end. And for me, I would say on the flip side, enjoy in the field. Like I think some of the opportunities I have now that I've been able to film and not shoot as much these last couple of years is like, you know, get to where you like the dog's bringing the bird back. It's perfect for the film. But for me, it's like, I, I've always said I've hunted, I've always pheasant hunted or, and I've enjoyed duck hunting even more because I have a dog one because of the work you do. But when I'm out there and everything's going right or whatever, it's like, I, I catch myself. I flash back to the day that it sucked. I flash back to the day the light bulb went off for this one thing I wanted the dog to do. And so you do all this work, you do all the prepping, all the training, you know, all this repetitive stuff we have. But the thing I, I want to close on to is like what you said, enjoy that grind to it. And I would push it further and say, enjoy the times that you have that. Because for us, 10 years goes by like that. Like it is not very long. And then you start over, you know, you work in, if you want to work with another dog. And I, um, not say that I come into tears or anything like that, but when I watch my dogs work, but like I start beaming as if, you know, I just had my first kid or something like that for the, oh, yeah, for, the, for sure. the simple fact of, of take that in. And like I said, it's not so much the kill and the limits as more as older I get here now. Uh, I, it's more capturing it on film because I go back and watch a lot of our hunts that we do before. And I just try and break, bring it in and take it in for the, the amount of work because if you just go out in my opinion if you put in all that work and you go out there and you literally just you know i gotta get my three pheasants i gotta get my five six ducks okay you know and the dog's not a part of your family then and and we could be wrong in this like i want to preference and say that that there's a lot of people out there the dog is a tool and it is at yep. some point um and that's fine like they have a different view on it i mean i know people that use horses as pets and we got buddies that use horses as a tool for cattle, that kind of thing. Yep. It's, oh, yeah. Yeah. it's the same thing with the dog. So I'm not saying that this or right, you're wrong, vice versa kind of thing. But for me, getting more on the emotional side of things, I really take it in when you're out there in the field per se. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. That's like, I was already thinking, you know, duck openers in 10 days, mm -hmm. first couple of flocks on opener, I'm not even going to shoot. Mm -hmm. We're going to have some newer duck hunters with us and, I'll run the dog. I'll enjoy the show, and then I'll pick up the twenty gauge after that, and we'll, you know, we'll show them how it's done. I guess, but yeah, I mean that's where. Uh, until then, you know, I'll, I'll blow my call and I'll run my dog, and I'll, I'll watch the newer hunters enjoy it because that early morning show, especially when you got good dogs working too, it's it's so fun to watch. That's the best time to duck hunts. Sun sunlight, you know, break of dawn, shooting yep. time, get that first flock to come in, and yeah, it'll be fun. It's gonna be a blast. Uh, Look forward to it. Put in a lot of work over, you know, you have for five years now, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's obedience or whatever. And mine's been six. And I'll be fun to see it all come together again for you know, seventh fall in a row, sixth fall in a row now. And I think last year I got, I, I sent you a bunch of comments and then told you about the picture, like the video we did on opening day. We got a lot of comments and not that this is a prideful thing. I mean, I, I take pride in, but we're not bragging or anything. Right. But we got a lot of comments in the YouTube video on opening day last year for how AJ and I run the dogs. We, we did it to where we took turns unless there was multi, a lot of singles were working into our spread. When yeah. we, shot a, we shot a four man limit that morning. He, if I'd send Abby, she get the next one, Duke, we get the next one. And we worked back and forth. So the, the dogs were competing, but there's times where Abby stepped too far out of the blind. I said, no, she gave her a buzz on the shot collar center back in and said, AJ, she busted. He'd send Duke. And vice versa, Duke broke. He was halfway out there. AJ turned him around, sat him back in the kennel. He had to watch Abby go out there and get it. And AJ said the best. He's like, "What? how did you put it? He said, well, you know how they say dogs take on the personality of their owners. AJ's very competitive. I'm very competitive. And obviously our dogs were competing against each other. I think they did that one time each. After that, they knew who was yeah. up, listened to the command. And there was a lot of comments in that video that were – and I've even had it on – some of the, the goose hunting video I did this year, people commenting say that they're very impressed and happy to see that there are dogs that are working well together. And for me, I could have not pulled up the gun, not shot a limit that day, captured it on film and would have been very happy just by those comments because, you know, it's nice to see that other people notice when you put in that work. Not saying that's what I do it for. That's not what you do it for. But yeah, no. it's, 
for me, I'm happy way way they worked and seeing that somebody oh, yeah. else was too. It, it makes me kind of like when we had, I'll talk about Sadie again when I took her out, she's a good pheasant hunter. I get new people into it because I know I could trust her to bring the results to them. Yeah. It'll be the same thing for us on opening weekend. AJ's going to come out. He's going to stay at my house. We're going to scout for a day or so. And we're going to go ahead and try and put some hurting on some birds. And there's going to be some people that aren't as experienced in, in pheasant or waterfall hunting, duck hunting that'll probably come with us. And I'll be running the camera. And if he doesn't pick up his gun, pick up his goose call uh, or his duck call, whatever, but we'll be responsible for our dogs. And yeah. like I said, hopefully Elliot shoots his limit and he can give the camera. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can always count on Elliot shooting early limit. Yeah. Oh, Especially heck yeah. Especially if they're big birds. As long oh, as we don't have time. teal coming in. If they're big birds, yeah. I don't want to waste my shells on teal. I'm waiting for the big <laughs> yeah. birds. I don't want to, Yeah, yeah. He's, he's funny. There'll be six dead ones pretty quick with Elliot. Over. Yep, exactly. So, well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I know you got to do what you got to do here with the rest of your family. But I want to thank you for coming on. I really hope people, yeah, appreciate enjoy, it. I really hope people enjoyed this because, you know, the, like I said, the older I get, it's more about right. the intangibles. It's not about the kill. Oh, there's Duke. Anybody that's watching on yeah, YouTube, Duke needs a little yeah. cameo. Special, yeah. Special appearance. He's going to come out and hang out with us here in 10 days or so, something like that. But yeah, I, for me, it's, it's about running dogs, it's about capturing film. We get birds. It makes it both even better, but, that's what it's what it's about. I was really excited that you said that you'd come on and do this because, you know, it's it's something I hold near and dear to my heart. And when I tell people, and you've told people this before, you can go ahead and train your own dog. Oh, I can't. Yeah. You can. Anybody that's listening, watching this, if you've had an inkling to do it, you don't need the experience AJ's had, the experiences I've had beforehand. You can. There's like you said, there's so many resources out there. Or message either one of us we can try and help you i've got a couple guys that have you know sent me snapchats or ben's been working with his dog to keep it in the kennel more and so i've been talking to him a lot this week about it and he's doing a real good job working with her to keep her in there yep. so i really appreciate you coming on and talking about this stuff with us yeah no it was a good time i'll have to do another one soon oh yeah hopefully hopefully we'll do a little recap after opening weekend when we smash a bunch of birds we can just get on here while you're here and we can do a quick recap of our duck opening. hopefully yeah yeah that's the plan that's the plan so all right guys thanks for tuning in to the pop aka the Preston outdoors podcast make sure you go ahead like subscribe all that stuff and leave us a review on there so we can get more videos like this coming to you so thanks for watching tune in next time